Hello and welcome. This is the first in a series of CTO Roundtables on behalf of Keeper Solutions. Keeper Solutions is a, a market leading software partner for leading fintech and medtech and cleantech firms uh, all over the world. And actually one of the most interesting things that gets to happen at Keeper is the conversations that they have with their clients and partners, especially the CTOs. And so today I'm really excited to welcome some interesting people. So I'm going to bring them in from our green room. Thank you. So we have friend, friends and family of Keeper Solutions in the room today. And actually, we've got people from all over the world. So we have Nick is in. Nick, are you still in South Africa? Yes. Yeah, Nick's in South Africa. Tom's in Dublin. Brian, where are you today? I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta, Georgia. And I'm in the west coast of Ireland. Um, we are here today to talk about NFTs and sustainability. And uh, it's quite an interesting topic. It's a very hot topic. No pun intended. Sorry, that. But just off the back of COP26, we know the carbon output is of critical importance to our sustainability goals. Uh, and I think this is a, a really interesting conversation to be had at the technology table, because now more than ever, the impact of the technical decisions that we make, whether we're innovators or whether we're developers or whether we're consumers or users, will have a profound impact on our world. Okay, so who have we got in the room? So Serial Tom, you're probably wondering why he has such a strange name. Well, Serial Tom is actually an acclaimed uh, artist, a digital artist, and he was commissioned to create a piece of artwork on behalf of Keeper Solutions. He actually worked with Keeper to create a beautiful piece of digital art, which was an NFT and uh, which Keeper gifted to staff and friends. And so we're going to talk about why that is or isn't possibly a good thing. We have Nicholas Holm, the CTO of Keeper Solutions. He's a, a vastly experienced technology professional with extensive experience in cloud solutions, business intelligence, project management and implementation. And he's a firm believer in Kaizen, which is the practice of continuous improvement. And um, I believe in continuous improvement by making lots of mistakes. So, <laughs> it's quite um, a mouthful, Emily. Yes, yeah, I and, uh, uh, it's lovely to have you. And of course, Brian Lanehart, who I always call Blainhart, yep. sounds like a superstar, rock star name. But um, <laughs> uh, uh, Brian is the CTO, founder, and president of a co founder of Artist Technologies, um, an artist powers modern lending solutions for businesses, providing low friction, affordable financing to their customers at the point of need. So, artist uses um, and API-based platforms that leverage alternative data sources and machine learning and AI-informed decision-making to present real-time loan offers. Yep, that's correct. Cool. So really interesting, cutting-edge fintech, CTO development partner, and a digital artist. Tom, could you tell us a little bit about the NFT that you made for Keeper? Like, how did that come about? So Stephen contacted me last year. I'm, I'm not even sure when he contacted me. Stephen Walsh, uh, he's the founder of, of Keeper. Uh, founder and CEO. I'd worked with him before. They were always kind of open to kind of collaboration. They always kind of took, you know, what whatever style I was working with or kind of, you know, initially when they'd contacted me years ago, they wanted something based on something I'd done before. Hmm. So would you forward. be your art style before, would it, would it have been purely digital or, very, or like real world art? Well, I mean, it, everything was, was, was digital. So kind of the stuff that they'd seen me do before was, was digital and then kind of, but kind of in, in a different way it was it was very illustrative before and then kind of became more painterly so then yeah. for the for the nft i said to steven i'd really like to use 3d i'd, I'd like to use some 3d software specifically blender yeah. um which is an, an open source program 3d program and it's kind of it's it's really really fun to use it's really kind of all-encompassing all like you can do I, I, you can do tons of stuff in it you can do digital illustration you can do um, 3D modeling, you can do animation, uh, which is it's really kind of come into its own, especially in the last couple of years. Was that your first NFT? That was, yeah, definitely. My, I'd, 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 I'd heard about them prior to Stephen asking me to, you know, to do it and not all in a good way. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, Beeple it was the kind of the notorious trendsetter here. I mean, what, what I think NFTs has done has dragged blockchain into the mainstream. So a couple of the high profile art stories that have made the headlines was the sale of one particular NFT by a digital artist called Beeple for $69 million at Christie's. And closer to our side of the pond, Damien Hurst ha has released a very interesting series of paintings 
um, called the currency. He made 10,000 unique pieces of art with digital equivalents. And these were sold over a week at a, a starting price of $2,000. So that's a cool 20 million straight out the gate. But in, in principle, once you own one of these tenders, you have the option then to either own the NFT or the original physical art after a certain period of time. But when you make that decision, the alternate is destroyed. So it's really testing the metal of whether or not you want to keep the physical art having a Damien Hirst original in your on your wall or the NFT equivalent in your wallet. Um, and actually just looking at some of the figures in the first couple of weeks of trading, um, bear in mind that they were bought for 2000, the average that they were settling for was 60,000. Now I'm not gonna multiply 10,000 by 60,000 because I'll probably get a zero wrong, but that's an awful lot of money. <laughs> Brian, you've encountered blockchain in every aspect of your technological worldview. What's your take on on it? Is, is, is our NFTs just this year's Beanie Babies? No. So part of my background, I know CTO of artists, a lending company, but part of my background is growing up, I was a professional performance musician. So that artist background, and then some, somewhat ironically, I was actually in South Africa among a couple of other places in the US building production studios, movie production studios. Okay. And so something that was always in the forefront of those conversations is licensing rights. So I know a lot of artists and it's, it's a brilliant use of the technology. If I create a piece of art, I can digitize it as an NFT and then there's a single right. But when you start talking about other forms of artistic content or intellectual property, you can really manage in a highly efficient way on the blockchain, the derivative rights. So when you talk about a movie production, there are there's streaming rights, there's DVD rights, there's merchandising rights, there's character rights, all those kinds of things that get broken down. The current methodologies for managing those rights and who has access, when they have access, when those access expires, is a very cumbersome, often paper-ridden process involving a huge team of lawyers. So I really see once... Now that, the, now, now that the, the, the first use of art is on the blockchain, a lot of the other larger IP opportunities are starting to look their way going, mm. if I can create de derivative works and I can sell the der a derivative work to Netflix for the streaming rights or a de derivative work to AMC theaters for the, the movie showing rights, it makes it really compelling and really easy to manage those rights because now everything's centralized in one, in one, one single hub. So it's not just about the computational efficiency of blockchain that will help with the with the carbon footprints. It's also about the operational efficiency. Original NFTs were incredibly energy inefficient, requiring huge amounts of power. And a space cat, which was a, an early NFT, a GIF of a cat in a rocket, mm -hmm. it had a carbon footprint equivalent to an EU resident's electricity usage for two months. That's astronomical. But are we still talking the same kind of impact or has anything changed? Maybe, Nick, you could tell us a little bit about how NFTs are mined um, and what is the real like climate impact? Okay. So, yes, there's, there's been a lot of focus on this, especially in the news recently. And so the original kind of crypto model that came out was you would post a transaction onto a network and then there would be a bunch of peers that would go through and do some calculations uh, to figure out if that transaction was actually valid or not. And you would get a number of validations that would happen and that would tell you that, yes, this is actually the correct transaction. It's, it, it happened for real. And so that that sort of added in the whole value of the the blockchain um, so you could go back in the blocks and see all the transactions they're you, they're immutable you can't change them once they've been calculated and validated so that took a bit of time right i think bitcoin and it used to be like i don't know 15 seconds at the fastest it just depended how many people were mining how many nodes were employed and the difficulty of the algorithm that was set so the way that that was done is, has been changed a little bit now that was called a proof of work so you would earn the revenue stream based on this mining that you did to validate that that was a correct transaction. So we have this other thing now called the proof of stake. And there's multiple models around the proof of stake as well. But basically what happens is that you actually put up some tokens to be able to participate in the validation of those blocks. And so the algorithms that are doing it are not necessarily so hard because the number of peers are you know, more contained. And basically what that boils down to is a much quicker system and less computing power used to actually calculate them. So that's okay. that's the way that things have been moving recently. And originally Bitcoin was proof of work. Proof and of work, now yeah. more um, cryptocurrencies as well. 
Oh, and Ethereum was proof of work as well. It is still, yeah. They're they're changing. I think by twenty twenty two, they're they're changing to proof of stake. So you can still mine Ethereum at this stage, I believe. Yeah, but there there's some networks that are coming out addressing the carbon footprint. If you're familiar with Tezos or Wax, Tezos is claiming a two million percent decrease in computational costs, therefore carbon footprint costs. And so just as with the nature of any technology, when we first came out with jets, for example, they were horribly fuel inefficient and polluted the skies. And as we mature the technology, they become more efficient. It's very much the same thing here. People are, are really complaining about the expense of, and it's not just, they're complaining on two sides. The cost of running a blockchain network is very expensive because of electricity you're paying for. It's also costly on the, on the environment. So we have people like the creators of Tezos or Wax that are like, Let's create a technology, like Nick's saying, proof of stake that's more efficient, that can run on a CPU versus more power hungry GPUs to make to bring the cost down, which has a dual benefit. The, the cost of running the network is lower, but also the, the carbon footprint required to power that network is lower. So I think it's just sort of a natural evolution where people are addressing these these issues as they come up. And actually, I think if it's the, I, more and more people actually have skin in the game, they really care about this. I mean, and I think I think CTOs care about this. So consumers, partners, suppliers and governments are all conscious of, of the impact. So it is really interesting to see the industry responding Now, whether or not they're doing it fast enough and whether or not the technology is evolving quickly enough is another story. Nick, so we started off this conversation with Tom talking about the NFT that Keeper commissioned. So given that a keeper is committed to becoming a carbon neutral company before 2024, why on earth would it decide to make an NFT given that there's been such an incredible backlash and it is quite controversial? Right. So we're, um, we, we, part of it was a celebration keeper has been going for 10 years. The, uh, another part of it was to include some of the let's say the, the Irish culture of it. So the, the NFT is a, a boat going around the Keeper Lighthouse. And we have been involved in blockchain from an application point of view, or been interested in it for a couple of years now, starting off dabbling around with the block stack ID so that we could uniquely identify uh, candidates and, and people that worked with Keeper and some of our internal projects as well, one of our internal reward projects. So it seemed like a a good idea and we actually used the tezos uh, network that brian mentioned back which has got a very low i think it's 0. 0.0005 pounds of carbon per um minted so when um so when stephen came to you tom firstly with the with the artistic idea and what was your what was your initial concern and and like how did you how did you broach it uh, well i when I first saw NFTs online, I saw David O'Reilly, he's, he's an Irish artist and animator. I saw him on Twitter saying that he's doing NFTs and I thought, what is this? It sounds great. Um, yeah. Then the more I kind of, the more I read about it and I kind of saw that the backlash and I was like, okay, this, this backlash seems justified, you know? Yeah. Um, so tell me yeah. how you voiced those concerns and, and what happened. What decisions technically were made based on those concerns, Nick? So we were aware of one of the most common things for this, especially from the NFTs, was Ethereum. It's been, you know, it's it's kind of one of the more mature that's called blockchain networks, and it was originally designed for these distributed apps. But that, it it does require the proof of work at this stage. So after some analysis, we decided to go with the Tezos blockchain. So, um, Brian. Uh... Do you think do you think the blockchain itself is overall can it ever have a positive impact on the environment or is it always going to be something that we have to kind of apologize for and offset and try and mitigate i think it depends on how you look at it i mean going back to what I, kind of what i was saying earlier if you look at the blockchain in and of itself it's always going to cost something it'll never be you can probably get it pretty close to carbon neutral if it's solar powered or wind powered you know relying um, lightly on um, traditional power sources but it's always going to consume power so it's not so much, it's not so much that you look at it in a vacuum. It's like, what, what is it replacing or what is it supplanting? Mm. And so if I'm replacing just as an extreme, if I'm, if as, as an example, not that the industry runs this way, but if all licensing rights for all IP today is purely paper-based and it's hundreds of papers of documents and there's hundreds of copies that have to go around to all the, all the players that have access to that IP, then that that's the offset. Like, you know, my recommendation is don't look at blockchain in, in a vacuum, look at it, what it's replacing, supplanting or supporting. Because yeah. that's that's more of a full full version of the equation. And can you explain a little bit more about how blockchain is used in the 
artists universe. Nick and I are collaborating on some, some ideas around the derivative works. I haven't seen a lot of derivative works. So, you know, in, in Tom's case, he could have a, an NFT that represents his work of art. And then he could use a derivative work saying, I will, I will license this piece of work for certain corporate install installations. So in a lot of the high rises in, in Atlanta, when you walk into the lobby, there's a huge screen behind the security desk and it's showing different works of art, different on you know, things that are going in, in Atlanta or different things about the business and the, and the thing. They love to do modern art. They love that modern art coming in because it makes the, the fresh, you know, it yeah. makes the, the lobby seem fresh and and uh, temporary. So that's that's a derivative right that an NFT could represent licensing to specific locations for specific durations mm. that allow them to use that image for certain times or certain events. It is really interesting to look at the unexpected side effects of things like secondary markets and and derivatives. And um, even the the Damien Hurst pieces, the first round of sales were created and then there was second round markets created for the mm -hmm. options to buy depending on mm -hmm. timelines. Right. So it is really exciting. And um, we gave I have a, my 15 year old and my 11 year old, we gave them both a crypto wallet and $50 and mm -hmm. have allowed them to experiment. And it's like, it's crazy. They've both made money. My husband hasn't, yeah. but both of my kids have. <laughs> <laughs> but the banks, I can also tell you, the banks are eagerly being in the, in the FinTech. We have a lot of banking partnerships. The banks are, are watching this. They're, they're anxious for it to become in their eyes, their minds real. So they can back it as an asset. Okay. And once the banks get into backing it as an asset, you're going to see it become a standard investment, you know, side by side with, with certain types of stocks or, or precious metals. And it's really around, from my perspective, it's really around those derivative rights that are mirroring what's going on in industry today. Just moving, moving what already exists, what they're already backing as an asset onto the blockchain will really solidify the value of the blockchain. And then you'll start seeing what I was kind of saying earlier, those operational efficiencies. This is, this is, this is less efficient than managing on the blockchain. And if you can get the banks involved because you have deriv derivative rights, because you're replicating a business model that already exists that everyone's already comfortable with, just on a different infrastructure then you'll start to see the a, a wider spread carbon benefit because you're replacing old archaic cumbersome processes with something that's more efficient. It is a hot topic and people are watching it very closely and evaluating the, the carbon outputs blockchain and NFTs, but they haven't necessarily been evaluating those legacy systems because they've been around for such a long time. I know that artists are, are really doing phenomenally interesting work, innovating the, the lending space. Could you tell us a little bit more about, you know, about that because it's so different what you're doing sure from the on the lending the consumer lending side yeah um sure so one of the things that makes us different is 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 the data we use to predict consumer loan payback behavior so for example everyone's familiar at least on the north america side they're familiar with fico score and fico score is a, is a snapshot of a person in time but we use a lot of machine learning and neural networking to to pull all attributes from a credit report that gives us a a, a better view of the behavior of the person so a result, you know, that, that's kind of technical to speak, but a result is I can, we can look at a, at a 740 FICO, which is a fairly high FICO, and I can tell you that they're behaving like a 680. So maybe you shouldn't give them the super attractive loan because there's, they're, they represent higher risk. But because the way FICO works, you're just seeing them at a point in time. But because of how we see data, we're looking at longer term behaviors. Okay. So that, that's one of the ways. So it's a much more interesting and much more nuanced perspective of an individual and all their data points. Um, so it's just really interesting to see how finance and banking is evolving uh, to take advantage of the the new universe of data that's that's now available. Is there any other big trends in fintech that you're seeing? There's a couple of lenders that are experimenting with putting the loans on the blockchain. So if if we if we extend a loan to Nick, then you know the loan itself is, is represented on the blockchain. Then every time Nick makes a payment or draws down from that, it's on the blockchain. It's immutable. It's a it's a database system that I don't have to support. I'm hooking into existing infrastructure. They're they're playing it out and they're kind of trying to figure out if there's if there's real if there's real value. Should they shift all of their loan mortgages? These are some mortgage companies. So these are you know higher okay. higher profile loans that they're playing with on blockchain. There's a couple of lenders in the space and a couple of fintech startups that are that are playing with that. Wow. Which okay. is which is interesting to see. They're they're still trying to figure out the fit. They they prove that it works technically. They prove that the data is valuable on the blockchain. Is there a real business value case for it? Is what they're kind of experimenting with now. So just over to you, Nick, in relation to fintech trends and the latest application of, of blockchain technology, what are you seeing? We've talked about fintech, 
but in in med tech and in clean tech are you seeing any other interesting evolutions of the technology so in the payment space there's also a lot of experimentation because you know the the efficiency of changing currencies across some markets and the regulations around it lend itself you know looking at a more efficient process like brian mentioned a bit earlier on med tech uh, there's a lot going on with in terms of the regulation of data so i think i think we'll see some development in terms of identity and and those kind of things with blockchain because it, it having an immutable record is pretty good with that and then the other side of it is in, in terms of the reward side so internally we've got a, a project that runs at you when you when you work with us we kind of mint these tokens so that as rewards for the, the employees so they earn a, a token basically but much further than that we've got um solo coin and we've got some blockchain coins that well currencies that are being minted and created for to reward people for the behavior so solo coin they mint um a token for every megawatt of hour that's generated by solar and i should i think that people would start to trade in those to offset their carbon oh. it is um one thing that nick reminded me of there's a company out of western europe i think it's germany that's doing dual opt-in on the blockchain so what they're doing is they're helping consumers get all their personally identifiable information onto the blockchain and then every time someone requests it on the blockchain it's an immutable transaction nick requested access to your personal information and then the consumer has the option of sharing it or not sharing it. As opposed to today, Facebook has untethered, unfettered rights to, to sell your data as many times as they want with or without your knowledge. Wow. So that's that's very interesting to me because we care on, on the lending side, we care very much about the security of our consumers and we do not sell, with, without exception, we do not sell or trade our consumers information. But having something more secure where your information mm -hmm. is voluntarily being put on the blockchain and you have direct access and you know who accessed it, when, when they accessed it and what was accessed, it's just, it, that's a big deal when it comes to identity management. Especially in the med tech space where patient data is, right. is so important and so critical. And obviously we've had a number of, in Ireland, the HSE I was the subject to a cyber attack. It's happened in, in a number of countries. So it's hugely important. And actually, if you look at systems like healthcare, which have, you know, big groaning legacy systems of, <laughs> of hardware and software, and also environments that are designed to have to be open. There's a healthcare system and medical devices where the information needs to flow between them, between outside and inside bodies. I think that dual identification point there is, is fascinating. Yep. There's a lot of resistance from industry. I mean, if you're, if you're Facebook or you're Instagram, do you want to have to get the user permission to sell their data? Right. Mm. So it's going to have to be this grassroots movement where people are going to have to take back their data, the control of their data, voluntarily put it on a blockchain that they trust, and then it'll start. But it, it's not this. This is not really I, I can't foresee this coming from really big industry or big tech. Yeah, it's, it's probably really going to hurt their wallets. It's probably going to come from general consumers getting more and more mm. educated about their data and their data rights. And it is really interesting to see as well that uh, across the board, Europe's GDPR policy is being replicated in a number of other marketplaces. If we think of GDPR as perhaps the gold standard, it's the most robust, mm -hmm. and now other markets are following yep. suit. We adhere to GDPR voluntarily, just because it's a good standard. Wow, that's amazing. But I suppose, actually, when you think about digital environments, if you think about online spaces and you think about geographic laws, it's kind of a bit like saying you have a no peeing section of the swimming pool. Like we're, we're all in the same swimming pool. Right, so right. data regulations, it's probably best to work to the highest as opposed to the lowest. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Okay. I'm conscious that this is a 40 minute chat, but Nick, your advice for CTOs that are looking to take advantage of blockchain technology, what are the big decisions that they should make first and foremost? Well, I think the, the main thing is to keep informed. The, the whole area is moving quite, quite fast. So there's, there's a lot of development happening in it. And when you're on the bleeding edge of these things, there's usually a couple of not so honest people involved in, in taking mm. this. So there's a couple of scams and things. And you've heard about the crazy prices that went up for crypto kitties and uh, various things. So just to keep informed so you can make informed decisions, I think would be my advice. Brian, any advice from you? I would, I would just recommend looking at it as another tool. It's another tool in the toolbox that, that can accomplish goals. A lot of people will will rush around cryptocurrencies because it's the next big thing, but they won't, like Nick's saying, take the time to understand it or learn it, or understand its impact on the business or the goals of maybe it's not a business, a nonprofit or something, or, or independent artists. 
what those goals are. You have to look at it like just another tool and it may have further reach. It may have greater impact, but for a specific case, it, it might not. Okay. But don't just rush into it because it's new. <laughs> and Tom, for you, are you happy that you have put your name onto? Well, I, I'm just really grateful that it was Stephen that asked because I, I know that he he's he's, he's a, a conservationist. He cares about you know he cares about the environment, and that when I did bring up kind of the the, the concerns, you know, he said, well we found a marketplace that, that's based on, on Tezos that's you know it's not proof of work so that was just it was very very gratifying that you know he was he was open to to doing that because you know I've, I've seen so many huge uh, companies like Disney they're making NFTs NFL Discord and like Disney made an NFT based on Wally which I thought you know the, the, the futuristic robot based on you yeah. know in the planet where humans have made the planet unlivable and they've all had to quite ironic really isn't it okay and so yeah. Um, as a creator, do you think that this presents a potential way for you to, you know, develop your art and develop your your artistic portfolio? Well, I think, like Brian says, it's 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 another tool. There's a there's a lot of stuff out there. There's a lot of NFT artworks. The most interesting ones for me are the ones that kind of use the technology, like kind of the the the, the generative art. I thought that was interesting. Um, maybe not all of it is kind of to my taste, but like things like CryptoPunks, that's. I, I think that's pretty clever. The, the Damien Hirst thing, I hadn't heard of that before. That sounds great. But yeah, I think just if, if you can use it in a way that's kind of meaningful. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think you're absolutely right. Blockchain is a tool. It's actually the creativity of the idea that is what really matters. And in this case, the NFT was a creative unique item that was given to keeper people in recognition of their support and it's something that they own and they could sell if they want or they can keep if they want it is actually a really lovely piece of art i i actually i really really love it it's got it's got real character keeper have a, a white paper a downloadable white paper on introducing the blockchain so i'll put that into the comments too and that i think is that i'm gonna just do some general housekeeping for those of you who haven't followed keeper solutions worldwide on linkedin yet you should because we'll be having more of these conversations. If you have a suggestion for the next CTO roundtable, the next trending topic in FinTech, please put it into the comments. And, and if it's something that we want to chat about, we will have a chat, which is exactly what Mike Mug says in Irish, Cade and Scale, which is Irish for what is the story? So we will certainly listen to the stories. Folks, thank you so much. I will say goodbye. I'll pop you all back into the green room and say thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank you. So that's it, everyone. That's me. We will be holding another one of these hopefully before Christmas. And I hope everyone has a great day. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.